I don't feel any pressure to change my science or feel uh, like I have to uh, commit to a certain narrative or anything like that. I'm free to do the research that I want to do. But with that being said, I do know that there are other parts of George Mason that consider our department sort of activists, or you know, not in the highest regard. How about dispensable? Sorry? Are you dispensable? You well, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm the most important person in here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just care less, so it's, it's, it depends on the day that you ask. What's the question? Just on, on a piggyback on that, so Dave Graff is a professor of economics at Randolph Mason, right? I don't, I don't know. But yes. 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 Huh? And uh, my son recently graduated from Governor School, Maggie Walker, and was invited to George Mason the uh, summer before he went to Randolph Mason for Latin Academy, actually. Okay. But George Mason had an environmental science or sustainability conference you're familiar with, or maybe you were? Not that particular conference, but we do, yeah, anyway, do you have a specific question? Yeah, the specific question is, does, do those kinds of conferences draw people from across the spectrum, I won't maybe go as far as deniers, but those who are on one side of the spectrum to the other, so you have different opinions, or is it primarily is George Mason sponsoring that from within, say, your department where so I can't really speak to that because I don't know for sure, but my experience in being involved with some of those activities is you generally tend to bring people who agree with you. So um, I suspect that there are very few kind of skeptics here. Um, if there are, I welcome you. So, um, but my experience is when we give these kind of talks, it tends to be predominantly people who already agree. What are your experiences like with climate deniers? Do you encounter a lot of them? Are you able to convert anybody? So I would say I've never converted. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, my, my experience is most people want to learn. And so I find that if people have real questions, you just engage with them and speak more this. So I don't interact as much with it with other people on the panel. Uh, but my experience is that when I interact with people uh, who are skeptical, most of them tend to be very earnest. They, just, they want to just have, engage in a discussion, have a, you know, what about this, what about this, have you thought about this, that kind of discussion. I find they're very open is, is most. More questions about this difference? In this case, we're doing the question and answer before. <laughs> <laughs> what aspect of primary uh, uh, right. is So um, most of you, most people don't realize that um, if you look at the warming that we've had and look at how much CO2 we put in, that scientists believe we should have actually seen a lot more warming than, than we observed. And the reason that we're not seeing that much warming is because we believe that the aerosols, that when we pollute, we're not only putting carbon in the atmosphere, we're also putting aerosols in the atmosphere. Aerosols are little droplets of water, and they get suspended in the air, and they have a tendency to reflect light. And so that prevents the light from going to the surface, and that ends up cooling the plant. And it turns out we pollute so much that it is actually hidden in some of the warming that we expect. So my research has been trying to quantify how much of the cooling has actually been responsible uh, by the aerosols, which is how much warming we should have seen. So I felt like that's really one of the most important numbers in, for the human, history of humanity. Because um, if we knew how much warming we could be in the future, we could make policy, better policy decisions. But the reason we have so much uncertainty is we don't know how much warming has been hidden in the past. So I'm trying to, I spend a lot of my time trying to sharpen those essays. Will you speak to um, your potential background in math and physics like yeah. on the quantitative side? Will you speak to others in with that same similar background who are perhaps challenging some of challenging some of these conclusions? What's your question again? Will, will you, do you, if you're doing a talk, do a talk rather than a question now, but people 
people who have the same background as you, that you know your colleagues in math and physics from the quantitative side and so forth. Do you have colleagues that you know that challenge some of the assumptions or conclusions? Ah, okay. I'm actually going to talk about that. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead. So what am I going to show you in this talk? I'm going to show you three major things. The Earth is warming. Um, we believe it's due to man. And that there's no real scientific reason to believe that the future impact won't be costly overall. Um, first thing I want to get across is that there's overwhelming consensus on the science behind it. And this goes to your question, do I have colleagues who doubt the science and so forth? Uh, this, this is a, a there have been several surveys where they've tried to do this systematically, and the number comes around 97% among the climate scientists who actually study this field agree that the Earth is warming and it's mostly due to man. And that's my experience when I go to conferences. It's certainly my experience in my own department. Uh, it's very rare to find someone who would disagree with those two uh, points. Uh, there are, of course, as a scientist, we're always arguing uh, and debating and looking at data more closely. So with, these are. They're not doubting the overall point that there, there's been warming and it's been man. And you'll see many people try to argue it's not really 97%, it's actually you know, thousands of scientists who disagree. And that's, that's just not true. And if you systematically go through that, uh, there's very nice work with political fact checkers. Um, because politicians will sometimes doubt this and then fact checkers will investigate this. And they, do, they actually do a pretty nice job showing all, all the reasons uh, why this number is pretty solid. Um, it's also true that most major governmental and scientific institutes that deal with the Earth and climate agree that the Earth is warming is due to man. Uh, that includes the United Nations, the National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society, and then the Academy of Sciences of different countries, China, France, Russia, Japan, and including our own government agencies, NOAA and NASA. So you may have heard something called climate gates, where there were, it refers to this incident in which emails were stolen in 2009, and it supposedly showed scientists engaging in a nefarious activity of hidden data, hiding data, and so forth. Uh, well, that was eight years ago, and there have been eight independent investigations of that, uh, and it, none of them have found any evidence of fraud or scientific misconduct. And here's a quote from the Department of Commerce Inspector General, no evidence that NOAA inappropriately manipulated data. So none of that is true. So let me get to the evidence of the Earth is warming. This is showing the annual average temperature of the Earth from 1880 to 2016. Each black dot is an actual temperature, and this is referring to the temperature anomaly, which is just the temperature where we subtract off some reference temperature, which doesn't matter because we only care about the, the changes. Uh, and what you see, and then the red curve, by the way, is a smooth version of those black dots. And what you see is that over the past 130 years, the temperature has been rising. Uh, you may have heard something like the war global warming stopped in the past 17 years or something. That's referring to the fact that this red curve leveled off for about 15 years. But you can see what happens in the last three years is that uh, we set records for each of those three years. And that's exactly what scientists have predicted, by the way, is that the, the reigning theory about why, by the way, you can see that this occurred several times in the past. There's a period of about a decade where the temperature didn't continue to rise. And the argument and the explanation is that the Earth, you can already see there's variability here. It's not a smooth curve. And it turns out some of that variability can persist for five or 10 years. And so the, argument, so the explanation for that was that it's this kind of variability but the nature of that variability is that, that it, uh, what's happening is that some of that oat, some of the heat gets um, buried into the ocean, but because the ocean has these circulations, sometimes that heat will come back out. And so the prediction was eventually it would come back out and we, we'd see super warming. And that's actually what you see, is that this rate of warming here is faster than what you see in the past. Uh, but that's not our only evidence for climate change. It comes from other multiple independent indicators. And here I'm showing uh, a few of them on this uh, figure here. Each uh, panel here is showing some time series or some data from 1850 to 2010. Uh, on the top, I'm showing what's called land surface air temperature. So in the previous figure, I'm showing land plus ocean, but you can look at them separately. And that's what this top figure is. And you'll actually see there's multiple curves here. And the reason for that is, is that we don't actually measure global temperature, right? We don't have a thermometer every square inch of the world. 
So um, uh, different, when, when you take these thermometer measurements, we have to do something to fill in the gaps, and different people will make different, slightly different assumptions about how you do that. Uh, and then also the temperature that you record is not perfectly accurate, so there's uh, uncertainties associated with that. And different people make different, slightly different assumptions about that. And here, you, what I've done here is plot them all on top of each other, and you see that they're all, they're all agree with each other. So different people uh, will look at the same data and pretty much agree that there's global warming. The next one here is sea surface temperature. So this is a very different temperature uh, data set. For the land, for the uh, land air, you have a thermometer out laying on the ground, you have a tripod, and there's a thermometer being held. For the ocean, you actually stick a thermometer in the water. So it's a very different data set, completely different. Different people, different thermometers. Um, but still, you can see uh, there's warming in there. Marine air temperature, again, this is a thermometer uh, 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 on a boat, and you're recording the temperature maybe two meters above the surface. Did you have a question? Yeah, how do you get historical data on water temperature? Uh, so, uh, ships in the past hundred years, it's a part of the nautical history, is uh, as ships go out, they will take uh, measurements about the, the currents and the temperature of the, of the water they're in. And we actually go back and, re and extract them. And they're, they're scientists who love going into these archives and they flip through these old pages where they actually measure them. And that's part of that data. Uh, sea level. So, very basic property of water is if you warm it, it expands. So you all know that if you have a freezing spell and the pipes freeze and then it warms and thaws and it's, uh, your pipes tend to burst, that's because the water is expanding. So if there's global warming, you would expect a sea level to rise because the water is just expanding. And yeah, this is exactly what we observe. Arctic sea ice. So in the Arctic, the ice lays on water and the water is warming. So as the water warms, you expect the ice to melt. And so this is another, we have several different data sets all agree that since the 1950s there's been rapid uh, decrease in the amount of Arctic sea ice. This top uh, right figure, something called tropospheric temperature, is the temperature of the whole column above you. So from here to about 35,000 feet above. And this is based on balloons and satellites and so forth. So if you do Google searches or if you keep up the, uh, with the controversies, uh, you may have heard that there is a discrepancy between satellite measurements and uh, ground-based measurements. Well, it turns out that the satellites turned out to be wrong. There was bugs, and then when you correct for that, now the measurements are more or less consistent with each other. Uh, and they all agree that there's a, a warming. Uh, the next here is heat content, which is the average temperature in the upper 700 meters of the ocean. So there you take a thermometer and actually measure the whole column of water, and you average all that up. Uh, and again, if there's global warming, you expect the whole column to warm up, and that's exactly what you see. So the humidity is also going up, so warm air carries more moisture. So you can measure the moisture directly, and then you can record to see if it's increasing. That's, that's also increasing. This is uh, snow cover. So as you know in your daily experience, snow cover is a very erratic thing. You can have years with no snow, and others you have a lot of snow. So it's a very noisy data set, uh, so it's not as clear, but still you can see there's a slight decline. And then glacier mass balance. When you have warmer uh, temperatures, the freezing level around mountains goes up, and that will end up melting some of the glaciers, glaciers on the mountains. So these are all independent data sets, all pointing in the same direction of climate change, of uh, global warming. Now the next question is, how do we know this to demand? So this is the, the most common question I think I get from my friends, is how, okay, I agree there's warming, but how do we know it's to demand? Well, another data set I didn't show you is the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, this is the red curve is showing the actual measurements of CO2. It's measured in parts per million, uh, and the black curve is a smooth version of that. And you can see that the car this is starting from 1959, and it started around 320 parts per million at this time period, and then now it's over 400 parts per million. So we've had a steady increase in uh, carbon dioxide. Now, there's no doubt. That's to demand. Now, how do I know that? There's a lot of arguments, but I'm not going to go through a lot of those arguments because even climate skeptics don't disagree that the CO2 increase has been due to demand. I'll just give you one example. Right now, we can measure, we know how much CO2 we should be putting in the atmosphere. The amount that you burn in fossil fuel, that's gas and oil, these are sold in barrels, is a very closely tracked commodity, and you can be sure that if 
America buys a barrel of oil, we're going to burn it. So we know how much CO2 we should be putting in based on how much oil we're burning. And if you add all that up, it turns out the CO2 should be increasing faster than what we observe. So the question is not why is CO2 increasing. The question is why is it not increasing faster? And the answer is that there are other parts of the climate system that are actually absorbing some of that CO2. So uh, we have a certain amount that's coming from fossil fuels. This is measured in petagrams per year. We have 7.8 here. Uh, and then when we uh, cut down trees, that those trees are no longer taking CO2. So that's effectively increasing the amount of CO2 that stays in the atmosphere. So really what's happening is part of that is going into the land and part of that is being absorbed by the ocean by processes we don't fully understand. Uh, and it turns out that about half of all the carbon we're putting out in fossil fuels is actually being taken out of the atmosphere by the land processes and the ocean processes. Now, why is the increase in CO2 of concern? I'm sure you all know it's because of the greenhouse effect. And that refers to the fact that we live on a planet where the atmosphere is transparent to solar radiation. So that means the sun shines, the sunlight passes through the atmosphere on, uh, on the turf, gets absorbed by the surface, and then gets re-radiated in an infrared radiation. And that's important because the atmosphere does absorb infrared radiation. So it absorbs it, re-radiates it back down, and that ends up warming the planet. So uh, the question you could ask though, okay, I agree that CO2 is increasing, I agree it's due to demand, but is it really that important? After all, 400 parts per million, that's 0.04% of the atmosphere. How do we know that changing 0.04% of the atmosphere is really that important? Um, so for reference, I'm going to show you, I'm showing now the CO2 for the past 800,000 years. Now how do we know what the CO2 was 1,000 years ago? So the method is very clever. So there's some parts in the world where when the snow falls, it never melts. So Antarctica, for instance, it's so cold that whenever there's, there's a snow, uh, it just stays there because it's so cold. And in the process of falling, it traps some air bubbles. And the next year, you get another layer of snow, and it traps new air bubbles. And the next year, you get another layer, and it's got new air bubbles. And this process keeps repeating. So we can go to these places now and dig in. These are called ice cores. And you can actually see the layers for each year that the snow uh, fell, and then they had little air bubbles. And so we can extract the air bubbles, and we're literally looking at the air that existed a thousand years ago. And so we can measure the concentration of CO2 that way. So this is what we get from this particular ice core. It back, goes back to 800,000 years. And here's the scale here. And you see that over the past 800,000 years, it has fluctuated between around 175 parts per million to about 275 par parts per million. So that's a difference of 100 parts per million. Um, so, and you see where, and let me remind you where we were, we're 400 parts per million. So, we've already, so this is another reason why we're sure the increase in CO2 is due to man, is because nothing like that has happened in the last 800,000 years. That's just another argument why we're sure. Still, I haven't answered the question, how do we know this is important? Still, it's fluctuations of a very small fraction of the atmosphere, why do we care? So for reference now, I'm showing the uh, temperature that, it, that it go, went along uh, with the CO2 change. Uh, how do we know the, te the temperature? So you can't take that air bubble I talked about, put a thermometer and claim that was the temperature a thousand years ago. That wouldn't make sense. Um, so what it's done is, a, it's, I don't have time to talk about it, but it's something called a geo uh, isotopic geochemistry, where we look at relative proportions of isotopes, uh, mostly oxygen. And from that, you can infer what the, temp the average temperature was in that area. And so if you look at that for the past 800,000 years, uh, this is over Antarctica, you see that it's fluctuated from about 0 degrees to around minus 8 degrees over the past 800,000 years. But the most remarkable thing about this is how correlated these two are. If I were to shift one curve onto the other, they would, look, they would lie almost on top of each other. So there's a very strong relationship between those two. Uh, now, if you look closely, You'll see that there are periods where they're warm, and then it decreases and tends to hang off, hang around in this cold phase for a while. We have a name for those phases. Those are called ice ages. So the period between today and, and here is, is the difference between today and an ice age, and that's a difference of around 8 degrees. So sometimes you'll hear, why do we care if there's a projection for in the future of 3 degrees? Well, the difference between today and an ice age is 8 degrees. So 3 degrees is a pretty significant fraction of that. It's half an ice age. Um, let's see. Ah, 
So, okay. So, I think, I, in some ways, I think I could stop my talk here. Because I think if you are just a common sense person, uh, and once you realize that we put in the difference between today and an ice age is 100 parts per million. And we've already put in more than that. So I don't know who, and who could look at that and say, oh, we should have nothing to worry about if we put in more CO2 than is doing today in an ice age. Now, the next question that people will ask, though, is, well, you see it has fluctuated in the past. What caused those fluctuations? Maybe uh, that's what's going on today. One of the most important points I want to get across is that we don't believe that these fluctuations occurred by themselves. We believe that they were pushed. We think when there was an ice age, the Earth was pushed into an ice age, and then it was pushed out of an ice age. And the question is, what's doing that pushing? Uh, the theory for that uh, was proposed in the 1930s by a Serbian mathematician and astronomer named Likovic. And what he was doing was calculating the orbit of the Earth. Uh, and if you ever took physics, you might know that if the Earth and the Sun were the only two objects in the universe, we know what would happen, and that the Earth would uh, orbit the Sun in an ellipse forever without changing. But we're not the only objects in the universe. Uh, of course, we're in the solar system, and there are other planets. In particular, Jupiter is a massive planet. And Jupiter has its own gravitational pull. And so what happens is as the Earth goes around the Sun, the J Jupiter and Saturn will, all, will uh, perturb this orbit. And because the uh, planets orbit around the sun, there's a periodicity to this. There's a time when they all rearrange and look the same. And so it turns out, when you add up all those perturbations, it changes the shape of our orbit from something that looks like an ellipse to something that looks like a circle with a periodicity around 100,000 years. And then there's other uh, perturbations as well. Uh, there's something called obliquity, which is this, the angle that the North Pole points at. And that has a periodicity of 41,000 years. And then the precession, which is what the motion of top makes when you spin it. And that precesses around 26,000 years. Now, if you go back, uh, this green curve is the same temperature that I'm showing for the past 800,000 years. And then uh, the top three figures here, or this time series, I'm showing uh, 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 the calculated value of these uh, measures of eccentricity, the obliquity, and precession. And you can see that whenever the eccentricity is at a high value, we also have a warm temperature on the planet. So uh, if I look at this one again, high eccentricity, warming, high eccentricity, warming. So it seems like these are occurring every 100,000 years because they're being forced by the changes in the Earth's orbit. So the question is, could that be what's causing warming? Well, if you look at the curves, you can see that actually the time that you spend in a warm phase is pretty small, and that most of the time you're spent actually heading toward an ice age or being in an ice age. So you see where we are today. That's, this is zero here, this is today, and this is before present. So we're at that peak. So if anything, you would predict that, the, that these mechanisms would be pushing us an ice age. So it's in the wrong direction. So if someone says, hey, couldn't this be the natural things that we've seen in the past? Well, it's in the wrong direction. There's another problem which is the time scale. So if you look at the time scale over which uh, we would be heading into an ice age, it's on the time scale of 40,000 years. Whereas the projections we're talking about for climate is around 100 years, 200 years. So that's a very, so the mechanisms we're talking about uh, uh, for 40,000 years is almost constant, barely, barely changing, whereas the, the man's influence is actually uh, much more rapid than that. Let me skip that. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that the Earth is warming, and it's due to man. So now let's talk about the root, what the risks are. Um, now, some of these risks you can kind of extrapolate from what I've already said. So you're going to have warming, so the planet's going to get hotter. You're going to have more heat waves, and so forth. Also, when you have warming, you're, the water expands, the sea level will rise. So those are pretty straightforward, pretty solid. I kind of want to discuss some of the uh, things that you might not put together. Uh, so one has to do with the water cycle. And one basic thing that we're pretty confident about is that when you're in a warming, if you're in a warmer world, you're going to get more evaporation from the ground. And that's just basic physics. If you, as you warm the air, it can absorb more moisture. And so that has a sucking action. And so we think that there's going to be a tendency to dry out the soil faster as a result of global warming. And that means crops will be more susceptible to drought. 
So we would, this has been a prediction that's been around for quite a while, that in a warming world you expect to see a higher frequency of droughts just from this mechanism. However, um, as you evaporate water, the water goes in the atmosphere, the atmosphere actually cannot hold a lot of water. So that water has to come back down. It can't, it can't collect water. And so another prediction is that we expect that on, a, on a global average, the amount of precipitation will increase just because you have just more water going into it. Um, and unfortunately, the science is pretty also solid that the form in which this precipitation will come down is in, in the form of more intense downpours. So it's not just a trade-off of nice evaporation and then nice precipitation. It's nice evaporation and then a downpour all at once. And that's not so good for the soil because you get a lot of runoff. So the soil can't, doesn't have time to absorb that water if the water comes down too fast. As a result, uh, we would expect that the, uh, most places were going to be more susceptible to drought. Here's a projection from scientists at NASA out to 2095. Um, where we see blue color are areas where we think that soil moisture will actually go up, and that's mostly because of ice melting or snow melting in that area. Uh, and the brown colors are areas where we think the soil moisture will get drier. And so you see over all of the United States, there's a, a projection that's going to get drier. What's uh, sort of concerning, that sort of, but what's concerning about this projection is that the magnitude of this is so large. Um, you would anticipate the, dry, the droughts would be drying larger than those that we've seen in the past thousand years. And in terms of how we would deal with that in society, you know, America is a resilient country, but notice that this uh, projection is also all of Mexico is in this dry area. So you would anticipate that on your border you're going to have, in the future, severe droughts, and how comfortable are we with having a, 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 you know, a, a country on our border with millions of people experiencing agricultural droughts. Well, another point that is not stressed in the media, and really should be, is the fact that um, we believe, we're sure the ocean will get more acidic. And the reason we know that is basic chemistry. So uh, carbon dioxide, whenever it gets absorbed by water, turns into car carbonic acid. It's a very well understood uh, inorganic chemical reaction. We understand it very well. And as you increase carbon dioxide, you're just, that carbon will get into the ocean and make it more acidic. And that decreases the amount of carbon ion I have, which is used to form carbon shells. And so the sea life that, use, that has shells is going to have a, more trouble uh, forming those shells in a warming world. Uh, and actually, this is, a, this is a global phenomenon, right? The, the, we, the, you know, the, ocean, the ocean pH is pretty constant. So as it goes down, it's going to be going, da going down everywhere, becoming more acidic everywhere. And you've probably heard of story, these uh, stories that are covered with the coral bleaching events um, that we're seeing now are unprecedented. And we believe this is a, a result of this. And this is a pretty solid prediction. This is not, you may hear scientists are trying to quantify the impact and it's hard to be quantitative. This is not one of those areas. This is a very well understood inorganic chemistry. Uh, here's a list of other projections. I'm not going to go through this list. Uh, I wanted to just put a slide over here that had numbers. And I've ordered it from the areas where we're most confident to areas where we're least confident. So the most confident thing we're, we're projecting is about a three degree rise in the next 100 years. Remember, that's about a half an ice age, but the other direction. Uh, sea level, pretty solid uh, prediction, around three feet in the next 100 years. Arctic sea ice will be virtually non existent in the next 100 years. Uh, those are very credible uh, predictions. Um, and, the, and the ocean will get more acidic. If I start from the other side, um, we're anticipating that the number of tropical cyclones will actually not increase, it actually will go down. But the number of intense cyclones will actually go up, we think. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all that. I wanted to actually make a few comments about Virginia and the local area. So, for perspective, uh, this has shown the temperature change since 1976 over every county in the United States. And you see Virginia. And actually, you see Virginia is part of the United States that has not seen as much warming as other parts. So this, that's a famous area we call it, scientists call it the warming hole. So if you look at a map of global uh, warming across the world, across the globe, uh, this is one of the few places that hasn't warmed as much as other places. Now, why is that? It's a very interesting scientific question. Um, I don't have time to go through the theories. I can talk about that later. 
Um, but all the mechanisms are all temporary. And so all the projections are that whatever uh, slight, uh, whatever less warming we've seen in the past, that's not going to save us in the future. It's going to continue to go. Um, let's get that. Uh, and then the sea level. Sea level is probably the, probably the most immediate urgent topic in Virginia in terms of climate change. Um, this is, uh, the blue curve is showing actual measurements of sea level from Sewell's Point in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and the blue curve here is showing uh, the linear trend for that. And the red curve is showing the global average trend. So what's happening in Virginia is you're seeing sea level that's much faster than what the rest of the world is seeing. Now why is Virginia being picked on and seeing much uh, more sea level rise in other areas? And the reason is because Virginia is sinking. And the reasons it's sinking have, are very fascinating. Um, one point I'll mention is, uh, remember there are these ice ages. In the last ice age, there was about a mile of ice on top of New York. And when you have that much ice on the continent, it actually uh, deforms the, the earth. And in that process, Virginia actually raised. And then when the ice melted, and the ice ice melted, now Virginia is starting to still sinking. It takes thousands of years for that sinking to, to subsist. So part of the reason Virginia is in uh, deep trouble, actually, is because, uh, because you not only have sea level rise, but also the sinking is making the sea level actually rise faster. All right, so now the question is what should be, hopefully I've convinced you that there is warming caused by man, um, and there are implications that can be costly. Um, but what should we do about this? So at this point, I want to make it very clear that now we're stepping in beyond science. Everything I've talked to so far has been scientific. It's all a question about what will the Earth do when you increase this carbon dioxide. That's a purely scientific question. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. What you should do about it is no longer a scientific question. It's a question about your values. And it's a question about economics. What's, what's the most economical thing to do? So I'm not here to try to change your values. I just want to go over some of the things that have been proposed to give a scientific perspective on that. So the, the, so the obvious things, and the science is strong enough to say it's the car, all the carbon you put in the atmosphere is going to lead to these climate impacts. So we need to do some, something to prevent the carbon from going up. So the basic thing is, what can you do to reduce carbon emissions? Here are the list of things you could stop encouraging fossil fuel production. So uh, today, ExxonMobil is the most profitable country, uh, company in the world, possibly in the history of civilization, and we give billions of dollars of subsidies to Exxon. So even Republicans that I talk to uh, get a little squeamish if I ask, "Are you in favor of giving billions of dollars of subsidies to Exxon?" So. Uh, also, you will also hear arguments we shouldn't pick losers or winners and that the government shouldn't do that, but we're doing that with the fossil fuel industry. So uh, one thing is we could just stop encouraging that. Another is to reduce the demand, such as improving efficiency, make things more efficient, and we don't demand the carbon as much. Uh, or encourage other energy sources that don't put up as much carbon. So for instance, solar cell. Demand. So the reason I put all these up here is there's almost no disagreement about this, even across the party. And who's against solar wind? If you ask a, you know, anyone, are you in favor of encouraging solar cell energy? Almost everyone says yes. So there's actually a lot of agreement. This is one of the fascinating things about climate change, is that sometimes you find that people will agree on the solutions even if they don't agree on the problems. Even if they're, they just don't believe in climate change at all, they tend to support these things. So I think that's one part we should recognize. There's a lot of agreement. But uh, it, really, the sticking point is whether we should put a price on carbon. What I mean by that is if you put carbon in the atmosphere, should you have to pay for that? Today, you don't have to pay for that. You can put as much carbon as you want. doesn't matter. Um, and that's the part where there seems to be more of a hostile of a vision there. And so there have been plans proposed, cap and trade, you probably heard, or a carbon tax. Which one should we do? The honest answer is I don't know. So the science is solid enough to say we should put a price on carbon. It's not something we should just allow an infinite amount. But exactly how to do that is not something I'm an expert at, and I'm very open to suggestions, but it should be something on the table. Um, 
I want to talk about, so there's sometimes you'll be people who say, well, we shouldn't even do put a price on carbon. The market system is great. And if you just let the market system solve it, it'll, it'll solve all the problems. And there's, I want to make the argument that that's not going to solve this problem. And let me, and the economists know this very well. This is actually has a name. It's called the um, tragedy of the commons. All right, so suppose you are a business person and you have a factory and in the process of making something, you have a waste. Almost everything has a waste. And you're allowed to just dump that waste into a river. And now you've done that, but now your competitors have also making the same product, they're competing against you, and they're allowed to, to pour into the river. And so now, uh, for long, all your competitors are just pouring their waste into the river. Now suppose you look at the river and say, ooh, that's not a good idea. I'm gonna, I don't think I want to keep dumping into the river. Well, now it costs money, extra money, to not dump into the river. Now you've got to trap it, you've got to store it, you've got to ship it somewhere else. That all costs money. At the same time, your competitors don't have to do that. So the important point here is there's no economic incentive for you to just all along to just say, I'm not going to dump anymore. All right, so this is a flaw in the market system. <laughs> so uh, we don't. So uh, uh, not only does that work for rivers, for example, I just gave, but for other areas as well, such as air pollution. So air, if if there, if you are making a product and you have a pollutant, and your competitors have a pollutant, there is no economic incentive for you to stop polluting. Well, today uh, you can put as much CO2 in the atmosphere, and no one will bother about it. There's no law against putting as much CO2. And so I would, we argue that this is a problem of the tragedy of the commons, is that no company is going to voluntarily stop putting CO2. And so what do you do? And you all know the answer. In the history of civilization, the way this is done is the government comes in and says you can't do that. If you do that, we're going to penalize you, or you have to pay for it, or something. And from an economist, it's not a penalty. It's really reflecting the true cost of what you're doing. Right? If, you take, if you have a natural resource like the air, and then you put pollutant in there and it damages that. You're not, and you don't pay for it. You're not really paying the full cost of your product. So for an economic point of view, it's not a penalty. It's just reflecting the actual cost. Now, there's a big difference, though, between all the other parts where we learned our lesson about how to manage these things and CO2. When it, let's take the, the pollution in the air. So what happens to that pollution when you put it in the air? Well, if you have little particles, gravity will eventually pull that down. And let it settle on the earth. That will that process takes maybe a week. Uh, you may also put up sulfate aerosols, those are little droplets, but then they will serve as condensation nuclei, get formed in clouds, and then eventually rain out within the five, within about a week. So if you're in a situation where you make the mistake and just and allow infinite pollution, any, as much pollution as people want, and you realize this is not a good idea, it's you know it's making people sick and so forth, then you can make legislation to stop it. And within the next two weeks, your air will be clean. So that means you can make the mistake and then correct it later. Same thing for a river. If you just stop dumping, the river is flowing out to the ocean. So it's constantly flushing itself. And so after a long enough time, it will just flush everything out and your mistake is forgiven. That's not the case for CO2. Um, to illustrate that, I'm showing some calculations that are done about what happens to CO2 if you allow it to just continue to increase and at some point, you stopped it. So here, they stopped at 850. And you, you have no more CO2 in, into the atmosphere anymore. What happens to CO2? So in this calculation, you see that there, the CO2 does in, decrease. But you see it decreases over about 200 years here. And then it takes 1,000 years for it to come back down. Thousands of years. So then we're not in a situation where we can make the mistake and say, oops and then make legislation and have things fix itself later. So what can you do about that? And I'm advocating here that you put a price on carbon. Exactly how you do that, I'm open to it. But I think I'm, the, that's the part I'm advocating, is that we put some kind of price on carbon. Um, and just to let you know, that this is something that's supported by Republicans. There's something called the Republican Climate Leadership Council. It includes James Baker, which I'm sure you've heard of, Henry Paulson, who is Treasury Secretary for George Bush, George Schultz, Secretary of State for Reagan, 
uh, and so forth. These people are not people you would normally associate as in favor of legislation, but they have all come out and say, the science is strong, we should um, put a price on carbon. There's a strong consensus among economists with expertise in climate, this is what you should do. Um, now, one of the arguments that I hear the most is that if you put a price on carbon, then it's going to kill the economy, it's going to kill jobs, because everything is made of carbon. Well, everything takes energy to make. So even the food you buy is trucked and requires fossil fuels. So what happens if you put a price on carbon, then the price of everything goes up, and people who are, uh, who are poor are going to be hit the hardest. So it's also regressive. So British Columbia is not the only place, but I like that example. Other places have put a carbon tax despite all those arguments. And it has not been the disaster that uh, Republicans have, I hate to use the Republicans here, but uh, it's not been a disaster that some have predicted. Um, and the trick that they did that made it popular was they made it revenue neutral. So the idea is everything that had a carbon uh, involved in it was taxed as it came in. That means the government has an extra source of revenue. But then they brought it back to the people in the form of tax breaks or subsidies. And they structured it so it ended up that actually um, people who were hit the hardest, the poor, when the, they were given the most of the, you know, a, a, more, a larger fraction of subsidies than the rich people. Um, and as a result, it actually worked. It reduced the consumption of carbon in, in British Columbia. They were able to lower the income tax in British Columbia. Uh, and so they had the lowest income tax of any province in Canada. Uh, and there's no credible argument that they lost a job or economic growth. So if you look this up, there is some dispute about that. But the fact that there's a dispute sort of proves my point that it wasn't the obvious job killer, crushing economic thing that you could do. Um, so this is, I really like this example. It gives an example of where it's actually been done and it didn't have all this negative impact that people claim. And then another point is that this is the kind of thing that, you, that I would think that a conservative would support uh, it's a free market solu solution, right? You, you, you say, I'm going to put a price on carbon, but I'm going to let the market decide how to uh, deal with that. Are they going to sequester it? Are they going to make their machine more, uh, more efficient? Are they going to do something? And you're allowing the market to figure this out. Um, it doesn't go to the government. Um, so if it's revenue neutral, you take in money, but you give it back to the people in the form of taxes. So it's a way of just changing your tax law that you can think of it that way. And then in this case, you could actually structure it to actually increase the GDP. So again, people say, well, it'll, it'll kill jobs, it'll hurt the economy, it'll decrease the GDP. But actually, it turns out, uh, in, especially in British Columbia, it, it, it ended up in, increasing the GDP. And the reason was is because more people got a bigger tax break than the expenses they were uh, having to uh, uh, deal with with the tax. Um, I'm, I'm probably running out of time, so I want to go a little bit. Uh, I think, oh, this is my next slide. Sorry. So, um, another point, you've probably heard of this Paris Accord. 196 countries all decided that we should do something, and, and now Trump has said well, maybe we won't, we won't do that. Um, uh, for, several Fortune 100 companies have written a letter to uh, this Trump administration. Here's the, name of, here's the names of some of those uh, companies saying, actually, we should stay with the Paris Accord. So these are Fortune 100 companies, not companies that you expect would be in favor of legislation or climate change. Uh, and here are some of the arguments they give, and I'll just give a few of them. Um, since it's 196 countries around the world, it's a uniform, you know, there's all a wide agreement. And so for one country to be out of that, you're, you're changing, you're, you're, you're put yourself at risk of being uh, attacked and, uh, because of that. Um, also, you know, uh, I hear a lot about uh, and we need certainty. We, need, we can't have all this uncertainty with administration. Well, if, if whether you go in or out of the Paris Accord is a subject to the, whichever president happens to be in, that's a lot of uncertainty. And so these uh, people were saying that we should just, all the other countries are doing it, we should just go in too, and then that way, we, there's lot, then we can make long-term plans based on that. And so, so there's a lot of arguments for that. I think I'm just preaching too far. <laughs> so this is my last slide. I'm just reminding you that hopefully I've convinced you that the Earth is warming. It's mostly due to man, and the impacts are probably going to be costly overall. So thanks. <laughs>